Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I don't usually watch police dramas because in the police dramas they usually deal with some type of digital evidence and many times they get it wrong. So today I'm going to watch Criminal Minds a series that started in 2005. I've never seen it before. I'm specifically going to focus on computers or any digital devices that they're working with. Let's just see how they do. I'm going to start with episode one and I know that episode one aired in 2005 and a lot has changed in digital forensics since 2005 so I'll try to give them a little bit of a break. Let's take a look at this computer system. It looks kind of like Windows. I don't know, they have a folder here. I don't really know what this theme is. So it looks a little bit like a mix between Windows in some things. It kind of looks like an old Mac. I bet probably a theme that they've put over Linux specifically for this video. All right, so we have some sort of instant messenger and then we have a couple people here. Doesn't look like she has a lot of stuff on the desktop and nothing in the trash. So we don't really know what operating system is. is. I would guess it's probably Linux, but they're probably trying to pass it off as Windows. Pull over now. So this is actually more common than you would think. People post ads online and then you get into a car with somebody and then abductions happen. If you're going to test anything like this, if you're going with somebody you don't know, always make sure that somebody knows where you are and, and what you're doing at the time. 2005, it might not have been that common for people to have cell phones, so it could be difficult for her to, to text. So at this stage, the girl is missing and they've called in this profiler to take a look at the case. 23 year old Heather Woodland. Before she left for lunch, she downloaded an email with a time delay virus attached. The killer's virus wiped her hard drive and left this on the screen. So the killer's virus wiped the hard drive but left this on the screen. You can see that there's something in the back here. So everything actually is still up. There's a program running that I can't really make out. I mean, it looks formatted, so it could be some type of email. And then there's a program in the back and you would assume that that's probably an email program. It's hard to say, I can't really see what the what the title of that is. And then there's the icons for the desktop in the back and um, the system is still running. If it wiped her hard drive, everything is still available in memory. The email, for example, still would have been available in memory and they could just collect RAM and then get all of the data from RAM. They don't seem to, they just kind of give up on this system, even though there's definitely evidence they could recover the email and then uh, potentially investigate the headers and probably back in that time, find the IP address of the suspect immediately. Uh, there's still a lot of evidence here based on this picture, but if they just shut the system down and the hard drive was wiped, it's, it's hard to say what they would get back. Once they shut the system down, all of this would be lost from RAM. And then depending on how the suspect formatted the hard drive, if they actually zeroed out the hard drive, maybe everything's gone. But if they just reformatted or deleted files, then you can recover pretty much everything. So they're giving up on this system, I think, way too early. And they could have caught the person much faster if they would have done RAM analysis. But 2005, RAM analysis wasn't very common. So next. I'll get password. No, no, no. Wait, wait. It's not turning back on. Yeah, and it won't. They got to log in password and tried to log in immediately. That's just bad practice unless you have an, an absolute reason to be doing live data forensics. In this case, maybe they suspected that the suspect had an encrypted hard drive, which 2005 is possible, but um, it wasn't super likely. It's really odd to log into the suspect system on the scene like that if you just find a post-it note. It was What's a false on? password. The false passwords actually are a thing. You can have encryption, and then if you put in a different password, the entire system essentially locks up or shuts down. If you put in the right password, then you can unlock the encrypted container. The false password either shuts down the entire system or unlocks a different encrypted container that looks empty or innocuous. The big indicator here is deadbolt defense is active. So if you <laughs> if you go to somebody's computer and you see deadbolt defense active and then the administrator and it only has a password to log in here, like this whole thing is weird um, in the first place. But then the first thing you should be doing is looking up deadbolt defense and see if it actually is an encryption product. Or... There's no way that somebody who didn't know how to deal with digital evidence should be touching this, especially if they think that something like this, like this obvious is in there. 
What's the number six at the bottom of the screen? Number of password attempts where the program wipes the hard drive. So this is a bit silly. I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but it looks like the police brought in their own system. We have the suspect's computer, it looks like, on the left-hand side, and then some sort of password cracking system on the right-hand side, but they're still limited to six attempts. This is totally incorrect. So the Deadbolt software, I just bypass that and focus on the data directly. So if it's a popular software, for example, just get the encrypted data and then try to use your own basically login software to attempt password guesses against it. We wouldn't be necessarily limited to six. We would just make a copy of the encrypted data and then work only on the encrypted data with our own program instead of the unlocking program built in Deadbolt. So that doesn't really make sense. If they made an image a disk, a physical disk image of the suspect's hard drive, then we already have a preserved copy. So theoretically, if they use whatever their six tries are here, then we just use our copy again, and then you have six more tries. So like this whole setup of only six tries really doesn't make sense. You reach okay, so I don't know who this person is, but surrounded by computer screens with a bunch of code floating by, I bet this is their technical person, <laughs> probably. And oh man. Like, I mean, some of this stuff could be accurate, but um, let's see how this goes. Penelope Garcia and the FBI's Office of Supreme Genius. Hey, it's oh, Morgan. Supreme Genius, yep. Okay. Need you to work me some magic here. I got a program called Deadbolt Defense and a girl with only a couple hours to live, so what do you know? Then you got a problem. Deadbolt's the number one password crack resistant software out there. You're gonna have mm. to get inside. So it's the number one password crack resistant software out there. You're the FBI, you already knew this. They definitely have a module for attempting to to crack it if they already knew about it and it was popular enough to be the number one uh, resistant software it's definitely being tested by thousands of different companies not just fbi but any other government agency would probably be interested as well they should have already known something and had tools developed for it but uh, you know maybe not you're gonna have to get inside this guy's head to get the password you don't have to get inside the guy's head but the whole point of this is actually to do profiling so i can understand why if you can get inside the guy's head, then maybe you can guess the password. It might also be possible that you just ask for the password at the very beginning. That's really what they should have done immediately is just kind of, if they knew that digital evidence was part of this and they knew that it was password protected, ask what the password is because they might be thrown off and then just give you the password. But not always. The whole six tries is kind of a setup for relying on profiling to get the password. Guys, little help. We're going through every one of these CDs, scratches, wear and tear. I want to know which CD he plays the most. Let's go. That was real whenever CDs were a thing. Going through and, and finding out which CDs were the most scratched are a good indicator of how much they were used. So you can kind of tell something from it. In this case, it's hard to say what. <laughs> Maybe he's just trying to get the frame of mind or something. Yeah, so this is completely unacceptable. I mean, it looks very dramatic, but even if you're in a suspect's house, you would never do anything like this because there could actually be evidence on any of these CDs. They could have written data to, to one of the discs and the cops just come in and throw crap all over the floor. That's no, <laughs> like this is absolutely against protocol. It looks like they've been doing something, but basically they've just been tearing things <laughs> up. This is awful. Oh, that's terrible. Flipping evidence around. Yeah, good job. Been thinking about the CDs. So this was the thing. If he's talking about CDs and he has a safety pin, it's definitely in the CD tray. <laughs> so basically that's the mechanical switch. Whenever you put that safety pin in there, the, the tray will pop out. I think we may have missed the obvious. What are you doing? The problem with that is if that CD was actually like a data CD, then the suspect might have been running something from the CD, and as soon as they ejected it, then that program might actually stop running. So ejecting CDs from a running system isn't usually what we want to do. But I guess if they're locked out in this case, and that's the only way they can find the password, it makes sense. I think they got lucky because it is a, a music CD rather than, rather than data, but uh, you never know <laughs> until you do it, I guess. A lot of labs still have devices that basically you stack all of the CDs up. So whenever people have these huge collections of CDs, you have to image all of them and then process all of them. So basically we stack all of the CDs into this kind of tray, and then it has an arm that will come up, take one CD, like a record player, and then image one CD, and then move it to a different pile, and then basically image each of the CDs in the stack. And it's the only way that you could image, you know, hundreds of CDs back, back in the day. So I think we're much better off now with USB sticks. Heather's alive. 
How do you know? Because we're watching it right now. So if this is a live stream, you have you have images coming through. They could probably find the IP address of the connection right now for where this webcam is coming from, especially 2005. It should be relatively easy to work with the ISP to track this down. So you can get the IP address of the stream itself. It's probably not being proxied. Find the IP address. Uh, talk to the service provider, you can pretty much identify the location immediately. Can you show me the last 12 images lined up next to each other? Right there, you see that? The light bulb hanging from the wire? Yeah, what about it? It's shifting positions. So this is actually interesting. One big, big problem is that they're still doing this from the suspect's computer. So they are still modifying data on the suspect system, which you never do. Like we would just take an image, you have an active stream running, try to find out what you can about the stream, but, but you wouldn't be, for example, trying to take screenshots and just doing all of that on the suspect's computer. You definitely wanna be doing that on some other system that you control. Um, and then also capturing this feed probably to a system you control. This is insane that this is actually on the suspect's computer. And this camera is basically sending one picture at a time. So it's not actually a like a live stream, it's just a series of images and then we have the light swinging and then this type of video analysis is used all the time for trying to figure out where things are what's happening and just give more context about about things like this so that was really all the digital evidence that they dealt with in this episode of course computers are not super interesting to look at in terms of recording so you usually see people talking about them or flashing you know, USB sticks or throwing CDs everywhere. That's just to try to make things a little bit more interesting because in reality, we would be seizing all of that and then imaging each of those and then analyzing the images. Overall, I think they could have just had somebody on the work computer, either from logs, if the work system kept logs, most likely at the victim's work, there's an email server that's centralized. So, so even if the suspect deleted the files on her computer locally, potentially the work email server would still have copies of that email or something in the trash, for example. So there's lots of potential digital evidence they could have gotten from the work system that would have saved them a lot of time. They had the actual suspect system and they kept interacting with the suspect system. You don't interact with the suspect system. You either try to image it as quickly as possible, or if you absolutely have to, then do some live data analysis. But if it was already encrypted, you would shut it down, you would image it, and then you would try to break the encryption. That's basically what you'd have to do. So overall, they didn't identify most of the digital evidence that was possible. They didn't treat any of the systems as you should whenever you're dealing with the artifacts. And they just let a lot of evidence go that could have saved them a lot of time. And all of that was specifically for establishing that they can create a criminal profile. So not the worst treatment of digital devices that I've seen in a primetime drama. At least they were kind of accurate and you know sometimes especially first responders that don't know anything about computer systems they might try to log in lock things out alter data on suspect devices that actually happens um, so i guess the guy's frustration whenever the police officer logged in is kind of valid and justified because it does happen the computer expert saying that there's nothing you can do and that's that system is like the best encryption in the world. It does, doesn't make any sense. So overall, pretty interesting to see. I hope my commentary on at least talking about the digital evidence was interesting. They're kind of right, but not really. Uh, it's a pretty good episode. I think I'll keep watching Criminal Minds and, and see what other shenanigans we can get up to. If you like this kind of commentary, be sure to like this video and then comment down below if there's any specific series you want me to watch. I've probably not seen it before and I'm happy to give my opinion about their forensic techniques. So that's it for today. I hope you liked it. Thank you very much.